Okay, the title of my presentation today is the Schwartz Alternating Method for FOM-ROM and ROM-ROM coupling. Here, FOM stands for full order model and ROM stands for reduced order model. And I'd like to acknowledge some of my collaborators on this work, Alejandro Moda and Yuki Shimizu from Sandia National Labs, as well as Joshua Barnett, who's uh, an intern we have this summer from Stanford University. So let me start with a little bit of motivation. Um, the past decades have really seen a tremendous amount of investment in developing simulation frameworks for coupled multi-scale and multi-physics problems. And the advantage of these frameworks is that they will in general rely on established mathematical theories to couple different physics components. And so a prime example of uh, one such framework is the Energy Exascale Earth System Model, or the E3SM, which is the US Department of Energy's climate model. And what it does is it takes five uh, disparate physics components and, and couples these together in a way that ensures stability, convergence, accuracy, conservation, and, and so on. And so the thing to keep in mind when you're looking at these um, kind of established uh, frameworks that have um, a rigorous mathematical, theoretical um, uh, basis is that the majority of these frameworks are really based on traditional discretization methods. And so by that, I mean methods like finite elements, finite volumes, finite difference, um, perhaps in recent years, um, some, some meshless type methods as well. But in particular, um, uh, while we've had a very big push uh, recently to develop and integrate data-driven methods and models into modeling and simulation tool chains, uh, unfortunately, as soon as you start kind of coupling in these data driven models, whether they be reduced order models or physics informed neural networks, um, you no longer have that rigorous established theory that holds um, for coupling traditional methods and models. Um, and so this brings me to our project that uh, I'm uh, talking about today that I'm presenting work from today. Uh, our project is known as Flexible Heterogeneous Numerical Methods or FHNM. And the main objective here is really to kind of try to fill in this gap that I identified on the previous slide by discovering the mathematical principles that guide the assembly of standard as well as data-driven numerical models in stable, accurate, and physically consistent ways. Okay. Um, here uh, under this project, we're considering three types of data-driven models, um, projection-based reduced order models or ROMs, machine learned models, namely physics-informed neural networks or PINs, um, and flow map approximation models such as dynamic mode decomposition or DMD models. And we're also looking at three different types of coupling, uh, alternating Schwarz-based coupling, optimization-based coupling, and coupling via generalized mortar methods. Um, but in this particular talk, as the title suggests, I'm going to focus on the projection-based ROMs and the Schwarz alternating uh, method type coupling. Uh, but note that you will hear about some of the other um, types of couplings in a presentation by Amy DeCastro um, in the same uh, session as, as this talk. So the remainder of the talk is organized as follows. I'll um, overview uh, how the Schwartz alternating method works for coupling. I'll overview projection-based model reduction for those who aren't familiar. I'll talk about some nuances in extending our coupling framework to the case when you're coupling in reduced order models. Um, and then I'll, I'll show some preliminary numerical results before kind of wrapping up. So um, the first topic is the Schwartz alternating method. So um, let me talk a little bit about how this method works for those who aren't familiar. Um, the Schwartz alternating method is perhaps the oldest known method for domain decomposition proposed in 1870 by Herman Schwartz for solving the Laplace equation on irregular domains. And it's based on a very simple idea that if you want to solve a problem on a complex domain, you can decompose it into simpler subdomains and then use solutions on those simpler subdomains uh, to iteratively build the solution on the more complex domain. So a couple of examples uh, of different decompositions you could have are shown here on the right. So you could have a overlapping or a non-overlapping decomposition. Um, and basically the way the method works is you, you iterate back and forth between solving your problem in omega one and omega two um, with information propagating through transmission or boundary conditions on these boundaries, um, gamma one and gamma two in the overlapping case and gamma in the non-overlapping case. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk more about kind of some details uh, on the next slide. Um, at this point, what I wanted to emphasize is that um, if you've heard of Schwartz, you've probably heard of Schwartz in the linear solver literature, where it's often used as a preconditioner for solving um, 
linear algebraic uh, equations. Um, what our idea here is, is something fundamentally new, which is to use the method as a discretization method or a nonlinear solver for solving multi-scalar multi-physics um, PDEs. And so even though this is a very natural thing to try to do, and not, not a whole lot of people had, had looked at this at the time that we started um, going down this, this path some years back. Um, so a little bit more detail about how the coupling works. So I'm, I'm first going to kind of talk about the coupling in the context of a study problem. And so um, I have the algorithm uh, described here in the context of this linear elliptic PDE. Um, the PDE does not need to be linear. And in fact, most of our problems that we've applied the method to have been nonlinear solid mechanics problems. Um, but assuming this linear operator, um, these are the, the basic kind of iterations in both the overlapping and the non-overlapping case. Um, in the overlapping case, what you can see is that the transmission boundary conditions on these Schwartz boundaries, gamma 1 and gamma 2, are of the Dirichlet-Dirichlet type. Um, and so specifically what's done is you solve the problem omega 1 um, with Dirichlet boundary conditions on gamma 1 that are obtained by um, interpolating the solution from omega 2 onto gamma 1. Um, you then go back to go to omega 2 and you repeat this process. Now you're going to interpolate the solution from omega 1 to gamma 2. Uh, you go back to omega one and you, you, you keep iterating with, with these Dirichlet Dirichlet um, type uh, of conditions to do the coupling. Um, now you can show that this will converge provided your overlap region is non um, empty. Um, what happens in the empty overlap region where you're in the second case here, the non overlapping domain decomposition? Um, this could be relevant if you're looking at multi material or multi physics coupling where you have maybe a different um, material model or different physics and different subdomains. So fluid structure interaction would be a nice example. And in this case, you have to change the boundary conditions that you use. So you can use either alternating Dirichlet Neumann conditions or Robin Robin conditions to get um, a convergent sequence of the Schwartz iteration. And in our implementation, we use the alternating Dirichlet Neumann. And so that's what's shown here. You solve a Dirichlet problem in omega one and a Neumann problem in omega two. And um, you'll notice we introduce um, what's called relaxation in the Dirichlet boundary condition, which through the integration of this parameter theta, you basically can sort of use not just the previously computed solution um, as the boundary condition, but also some, some of the past information, which can help um, improve convergence. Now, um, Schwartz makes a lot of sense for steady problems. Um, it's maybe not entirely clear how you would extend this to dynamics without having to rely on a space-time method, which we don't want to do. Um, so we came up with a way to do time advancement within the Schwartz framework that allows for more traditional type methods where you first discretize in space, then discretize in time. And so the main ingredients are domain decomposition. I'm showing the overlapping one here just without the loss of generality. Um, there's a notion of a controller time stepper, which basically takes your global time, splits it up into these time chunks, T0, T1, T2, and so on, um, that allows you to sort of converge the method on each time chunk before going on to the next uh, time chunk. And then you also have a time integrator in omega 1 and omega 2. They don't need to be the same, um, nor do the time steps need to be the same. And so this, this picture shows you different time steps. And the way that this works is you first start with your first controller time step, you're going to take the solution omega one, you interpolate it from T0, excuse me, you advance it from T0 time T1 using whatever time stepper you're using, uh, you've prescribed in that domain. Um, now, when doing this, you're going to need to interpolate the solution from omega two onto gamma one um, in space and potentially in time if you're using different time steps in different subdomains. Um, once uh, omega one has made it to T, T1, you, you repeat the process for omega two. Now you're going to need interpolation in space and possibly in time from omega 1 to gamma 2. Once both subdomains have reached T1, you check for convergence. Uh, and if the method is not converged, you return to step 1. Otherwise, you go to the next controller time step and you repeat this process. And again, I just wanted to stress that this framework is very flexible. It lets you use different integrators, different time steps in different regions. And um, that can be very advantageous when you're, when you're doing um, multi-scale type of uh, couplings. And so before I talk about um, developing this method in the case of coupling ROMs, I just wanted to summarize some of the work we've done with this method in the context of high fidelity model or full order model coupling. And so we've spent um, an order of seven years or so developing this method for fom fom coupling and solid mechanics for both um, quasi static and dynamic um, equations with arbitrary nonlinear material models, uh, including inelastic material models. 
Uh, and we really kind of saw this through from uh, pencil and pencil, pencil and paper prototyping all the way to implementing the method in some production codes, such as our Albany and Sierra solid mechanics codes. And we demonstrated that the method has not a lot of really nice properties. So it gives you concurrent or two way coupling. It's easy to implement in existing massively parallel HPC codes. It's scalable, fast, and robust. It doesn't introduce non physical coupling artifacts that other methods introduce. It has a theoretical um, convergence guarantee under certain conditions. And importantly, it gives you this kind of plug and play framework that is really kind of the vision for this FHNM project that we have currently that involves the data driven model coupling where you can take your complex geometry, you decompose it into different parts, you, you discretize them separately, you can use different discretizations, different solvers. Um, you can use different non control meshes, different element types, different levels of refinement, and then the method will kind of glue these things together in a seamless way. Okay. So uh, that was my kind of brief summary of how Schwartz works. And so um, what our task in the current project is, is integrating into this workflow and this framework um, projection based reduced order models. And so before I talk about how we do that, let me kind of overview what is projection based model reduction for those who aren't familiar. Um, so I'm going to look at uh, full order models that have this form shown here. This is a second order in time ODE, and this is what we typically have in solid mechanics um, applications that are dynamic. And I'm going to demonstrate the POD Galerkin method applied to reducing the system, which is actually the method of choice for solid mechanics applications and the method we're currently using. And so the first step is acquiring simulation data. So you run your full order model for different times and possibly different values of your parameters, um, collect snapshot data put it in a snapshot matrix X, and then you're gonna, in your second step, learn a reduced ba basis from that matrix X. And we apply the POD, the proper orthogonal decomposition, which does a singular value decomposition on X, and then uses as the basis vectors phi, the M left singular vectors corresponding to the M largest singular values of X. Um, so the last step is the projection-based reduction. We approximate our solution as a sum of these uh, basis vectors phi and some unknown ROM coefficients X hat. We project our equations onto the modes uh, phi. And then in the case of nonlinear problems, we have this additional hyper reduction step, which takes the nonlinear terms and basically samples them at some small number of points called the sample mesh um, in the domain to, to prevent this term from evaluating like the size of the full order model uh, when you're trying to um, run this uh, online. OK, so. Um, in terms of kind of integrating the projection based model reduction into our coupling framework, as I said a few slides back, the coupling framework is very general and allows you to use different um, solvers or different uh, discretization methods in different subdomains. But until um, this uh, recent work that I'm presenting on today, the only discretizations we had coupled within the method were finite element discretizations. And so it turns out there are some nuances that one needs to think about when integrating ROMs into the workflow. And so I wanted to um, talk a little bit about what those are, um, just to give you a flavor of um, kind of things to think about when when doing this kinds of these kinds of couplings. So the first kind of nuance is enforcing directly boundary conditions in the ROM. Um, this is really important because all the coupling in Schwartz happens through the boundary conditions. So you need to be able to um, update the directly boundary conditions as you're doing the Schwartz iteration. Um, we use a method from uh, a paper by Max Gunsberger at Al, um, published in 2007. Uh, to do the boundary condition enforcement. This is called method one in that paper, if you'd like to have a look. And basically, we take our displacement velocity acceleration unknowns and we decompose them into the steady kind of base flow or, or mean, I guess it's not a flow, but mean, mean, mean part of the solution, uh, D bar, V bar, A bar, and then this uh, unknown ROM solution that we're solving for multiplied by the basis fee. And what we do is we construct the PUD modes such that they satisfy homogeneous directly boundary conditions. And then with that formulation, what we do is we basically, every time we have a new Schwartz boundary condition, we modify these D bar, V bar, A bar vectors to insert into them the Dirichlet data that we want to impose at, at the Dirichlet nodes. Um, so this ensures that we have a strong uh, satisfaction of the boundary conditions. A um, few other nuances. So, so as I'll show in some of my results, the choice of domain decomposition is important. And so ideally when you're coupling um, FOMs with ROMs or low order ROMs with higher order ROMs, you want to have some kind of error indicator that will guide in what region you, you put the, the ROM so that you have a, an accurate solution. Um, this is something we're starting to look at now. 
Um, another nuance is, is collecting snapshots and constructing the reduced basis. So ideally, um, one would generate snapshots and reduce basis bases separately in each subdomain without having to do a coupled simulation. Um, in the results I'm going to show, we uh, are not doing this. We're obtaining snapshots using a FOM FOM coupling um, using the same domain decomposition um, just for some initial prototype to gauge the viability of the method. And then finally, for nonlinear solid mechanics problems, which is kind of where we're headed, you do need special hyper reduction methods to preserve Hamiltonian structure. And so we're currently working on implementing the energy conserving sampling and weighting method or ECSW method of Farhad et al. Um, in our code, um, but the results I'm showing are just linear, so, so there was no hyper reduction required um, for, for that problem. So the rest of this is going to be um, uh, my numerical example, and so um, I'm going to show just one kind of initial prototyping case we've been looking at, and this is the linear elastic clamped beam problem or linear elastic wave propagation problem. The geometry is this clamped beam. We put a Gaussian initial condition shown here, and what will happen is this will um, kind of split into two Gaussians and, and propagate, and eventually you will get um, the mirror image of the Gaussian um, as the, the final uh, solution. Um, this has an exact analytical solution. It's a simple 1D problem, but it turns out it's a very stringent test for discretization and coupling methods, because if your method introduces some artifacts, you will see them on this problem. And so we tried a variety of couplings, as you'll see, both involving FOMs and ROMs, implicit explicit schemes, different time steps, different, different grid sizes. Um, the ROMs I'm running here are reproductive, and they're constructed using the pod galerkin method. And for this problem, 50 modes captures about 100% of the snapshot energy. So in the interest of time, I'll just focus on the main takeaways. Um, and the first one is we tried a variety of different couplings. And what we found is that the coupling will deliver accurate solutions, provided each subdomain model is reasonably accurate. And so it's a couple of movies here that show you this. So this is a single domain solution on the left, a three overlapping subdomain solution on the middle, coupling a ROM to a FOM to another ROM, and then a two non-overlapping subdomain solution, coupling a FOM to a ROM on the right. And you can see that all of these are indistinguishable, so we're able to get the solution quite accurately. And in fact, if you calculate errors, um, we calculated the mean square error, they're between 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, depending on which of these couplings you're looking at for the displacement and degrees of freedom. Um, now, those were just some kind of, um, you know, a few, a few test cases that I, I showed you. Um, there are many, many possibilities that one can do for couplings. And so in order to try to kind of understand how the coupling performs uh, under these different possibilities, we did um, a couple of kind of rigorous uh, studies where we um, did both ROM-ROM and ROM-POM coupling, where we kind of varied the basis size from one to 100 modes to really see how the method performs and converges. And so the first result I'll show is shown here. This is for the ROM-ROM coupling. Um, mean square error is on the left. In the middle is CBU times for the ROM-ROM coupling normalized by the FOM-FOM CBU time. And on the right is the average number of Schwartz iterations for the ROM-ROM coupling. And so a few takeaways here. So in the left plot, you can see we get convergence with mesh refinement, which is good. Um, you can also see that the errors are 10 to the minus 6 or less, provided you have at least 40 basis vectors. And if you go over to the middle plot, if you look at 40 basis vectors, you can see that with at least 40 basis vectors, we get um, speedups over the corresponding FOM FOM coupling for this problem. Now, it's interesting that the smaller ROMs are not the fastest here. The reason for that is that these ROMs are going to be less accurate. They require more Schwartz iterations to converge, as the right picture shows. And so as a result of that, you're going to have a longer CPU time that's required for those models to run. Um, looking again at the rightmost picture, which shows the Schwartz iterations, you can see that all the couplings converge in um, less than or, or at most four Schwartz iterations on average. With the larger ones, you're converging about two Schwartz iterations, which is actually less than the average number of Schwartz iterations required for the FOM FOM coupling with the corresponding um, domain decomposition and, and um, mesh resolution. Um, so uh, we repeated the study for FOM ROM coupling as well, where we varied the number of ROMs, uh, number of bases in the ROM domain from one to 50. And the results are a little bit different here. So you still see convergence uh, with the basis refinement, as, as you would hope to see. Um, but you can see from the middle plot that the FOM-ROM couplings are between 10 and 15% slower than the comparable FOM-FOM coupling. And the reason this happens is because for the FOM-ROM coupling, the number of Schwartz iterations actually goes up to about three. Um, and so this is something we're currently trying to kind of better understand um, in order to try to improve the FOM-ROM coupling performance 
Um, it's conceivable that with the um, non-overlapping coupling, which uh, this was with overlapping, it may be possible to reduce number of force iterations through that relaxation parameter that I mentioned earlier. But as I said, this is still a uh, work in progress. So um, the last thing I wanted to show is just kind of to comment that um, if you're coupling an inaccurate model to an accurate model, you're not going to get back an accurate model. You're going to get all sorts of coupling artifacts as these plots show. Um, and that really suggests this need for having a smart domain decomposition. Um, and in fact, you know, if you just kind of keep the same number of modes uh, as some of these you know, coupling cases on the left that don't work very well, like the 10 mode POD and 50 mode POD coupling case, if you keep the same number of 60 modes and you kind of distribute them differently between um, different subdomains, you're actually able to keep the error very low and, and get a very accurate um, solution. And so um, looking at uh, ways to sort of determine how to do this automatically in, using some kind of error indicator is something we're starting to look at now, like I said um, earlier. So just to wrap up, I talked about Schwartz as an effective method for coupling conventional and data-driven models, um, showed some promising preliminary results. Um, we're working on a number of things right now, including extending the method to nonlinear and multi-D problems, trying to optimize the coupling in the case of ROMs, um, developing these error indicators to guide domain decomposition in an error controlling way. And further down the line, we um, will look at um, developing snapshot collection approaches that don't require full system simulations, extending the coupling framework to include um, physics informed neural networks or pins, and, and also extending the coupling method to multi material and multi physics problems. So these are some references. The ones in blue are in our particular work. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention and for watching this.